RX Television on RxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition and Liquid Sunrays. I'm your host, Sadiq Faruqi. This is your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros, competitions, the Arnold Classic. Oh, just about three and a half weeks away. So whatever is on your mind, it is all on the tables. We now bring in Dave Palumbo. Dave, before we get to the questions, a couple of things. We've been getting a lot of questions about Dr. Blau. You've been talking about the gynecomastia surgery and the fact that he's one of the more experienced, if not the most experienced doctors out there. Well, we've been getting questions about where patients or potential patients can see actual proof, pictures, or any other sort of media to further uh, your claim as Dr. Blau being one of the best in the industry. Well, he's the best in the industry because he's worked on the best bodybuilds in the industry and, and the results speak for themselves. But I will tell you this, something that a lot of people have been asking me, and I, and I, I actually talked Dr. Blau into doing this. You know, he had an Instagram page, but I said, Dr. Blau, you got to put up some of your, the surgery so that people can see what it entails to remove the, the glandular tissue. And you'll see how good he is and how fast he takes these things out. It's amazing how quickly a good surgeon can do it. You go to Dr. Blau's, that's his Instagram, Dr. Blau, and you can actually watch, he puts videos up every single day of, of the surgeries he's doing. That's how many surgeries he does. He does like, like three to four of them every day. I mean, who, what surgeon has that kind of experience? Go there, go to the page, watch what he does. You'll see the glands. Some guys have huge glands, some guys have smaller ones, um, but it, he takes the entire gland out and uh, you'll, you can watch the surgery yourself. I wish I was able to see that before I got it done. I didn't know what I was getting into when I got it done back in 1991. So nowadays uh, you can really research your, your surgeon. And once again, make sure you're getting a board certified plastic surgeon. Uh, I recommend going to Dr. Blau. If you tell him that I sent you and RX Muscle sent you, you're going to get a discount. And it's going to at least cover, if you have to travel there, it'll at least cover your travel and your hotel. So you won't even have to worry about it. Uh, I would go to the best when it comes to that surgery because it, it is so cosmetic and it is so visible on your body when you're on stage. Um, I don't want to belligerent, but check it out at Dr. Blau's uh, Instagram. And then, of course, Dave, you have your uh, secrets to becoming a diet guru uh, upcoming. Why don't you tell the fans more about it? Yeah, you know, I got the, the February 23rd is the secrets to becoming a diet guru class where, you know, I'll be doing my 10 hour seminar and teaching everyone about how to be a coach and how, everything you need to know about diet, supplementation, drugs. It, it, it covers everything. It's a great course. To be honest with you, we probably have too many people already. I kind of oversold the course a little bit. I'm going to make one more seat available over the next two weeks. If someone wants to sign up, go to DavePalumbo.com. You can have the last seat. But it should be a real full class. A lot of good trainers coming. A lot of guys who are established out there. So you've got to, you'll make a lot of good contacts. What I found is that when people take the class, they become friends with the people in the class. Because you spend the whole day with them. You wind up talking to them you have a lot of mutual friends and interests and stuff like that and so it's a good way to network as well and so once again that'll be on february 23rd um, on mel chancy's 50th birthday so uh we'll say happy birthday to mel that day guys uh make sure you check it out at DavePalumbo.com. let's get to the questions the first two questions from the dave palumbo experience app the first question which our app producer mark snyder says we get a lot on the app the question is, started running Tren A at 100 mg EOD during my cycle. What dosage protocol should I use for cabergolin slash docinex to help with these side effects? I don't see this recommending in the cycles you've laid out. Yeah, I don't recommend taking cabergolin, also known as docinex, which is a prolactin inhibitor. I don't recommend taking it unless you need it. So, you know, most people who take Trembolone in reasonable dosages, 50 milligrams every other day, um, they don't experience any of the side effects of nipple lactation and, and erection issues. I only see that in guys that take very high amounts of it. So I don't tell you to take Dostinex prophylactically because I don't think it's necessary. There's no reason to put unnecessary drugs into your regimen if you don't need them. If you have side effects, and you'll know if you have them right away, um, they, then we do something about it. Then we take a half a milligram of uh, Kimbergalin, you know, every two to three days. But I don't just put it knee jerk in there. I never ever took a, a single dose of cabergolin or Dostinex or bromocryptine or anything like that. I never had any prolactin issues. I never had any, any side effects from it. If I, if I did, I wasn't aware of it. So there's no reason to start adding more and more drugs into your regimen just because that's what everyone else takes because there's no reason to. 
You wait for the side effect or if you go for blood work and you have high, super high levels, then you respond to it. Let's go to the second question again from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Dave, I'm having a hard time getting my arms to grow. What do you suggest I do? Should I train them twice a week? You definitely shouldn't train them twice a week. Let me tell you, if you have a weak body part, train it less, not more. When you train a weak body part more frequently, you already have a body part that's not recovering well. Now you're overtraining it even more. You'll find that sometimes the body part gets worse. So what I recommend you do is train it less. My arms were always something that I had trouble with because I had a, I have a very long arm. So to, to, to fill those arms out, it took me a lot. So what I did was I said, you know what, instead of just giving arms its own day, I'm going to actually give bicep its own day and I'm going to give triceps its own day. So I would train biceps and forearms on one day and then triceps and maybe like calves on another day so that I can just totally prioritize that body part. I didn't excessively do exercises. It was a short day in the gym for me. That's how I looked at it. I would go in, let's say if I'm doing triceps, I would do maybe eight or nine sets of triceps. I would go heavy, unilateral movements on a cable machine, really squeezing and focusing, going heavy, but also making sure I'm using full range of motion and good form. And you know what? My arms responded because I wasn't worried about doing another body part after or before that. It, it just seemed to, to, to work and I gave and I was doing an eight day split at that point so my arms were getting trained once every eight days. So I was getting two days off out of that eight days. I was training six days in that eight day cycle and it worked for me. And you know look if you have if you're really stuck and I was doing this as well uh, because I did have a, a long arm I was using uh, the Chris Clark uh, synthesized pump and pose. I was doing, you know, sight injections in there with that. And so the combination of the unilateral movements, the more rest, the higher intensity type, you know, training, along with the, you know, the, the sight injection oil, that worked. That's what built my arms. And my arms were 22 inches, 22 and a half inches at, 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 at uh, my biggest. And when I first started, they were the weakest body part I had. So you can do it if you, if you set the right schedule up and you're smart about how you go about it. Dave, before we jump to the Instagram questions, our producer, Mark, Mark Snyder, for the Dave Palumbo Experience app, uh, mentions how you're now adding the weekly workouts to the app for those interested, if you want to tell them a little bit more about it. Yeah, you know, people for years have been asking me about, you know, they want workouts. And I always give them my, my workout that I always did, you know, pretty much. And, you know, people like variety. So, you know, because we have the Dave Palumbo Experience app and we have people signing up, and by the way, if you want to sign up, you go to the iTunes store or your Android store, it's $29 a month. You have access to all my articles and videos I've ever written and, and recorded. You also get a private, you know, Q&A video every single week just for the app members. Also, you have the ability to ask me as many questions as you want, and I will answer them on the app. The best ones go on video, but the great thing is that you get to see all the, all the app members' questions. It becomes, it's in a, a public forum on there, so that's good, so you can see maybe you weren't thinking of a certain question, but someone else was. Now what we're offering is every week there'll be a, a workout up there, so you can take that workout every week and have a slightly different one to apply, so you don't have to think and, and make changes yourself. People seem to like that. We're offering that new service. And you know, a lot of people ask me, Hey, Dave, how do you train? How do you implement your workout? You know, because I do less sets. It's high intensity, heavier weights, lower volume. So rather than doing four sets per exercise with six exercises and doing 24 sets, I'm doing maybe three to four exercises, you know, anywhere from two to one set per exercise. So how do you go about doing that? Well, you know, you go into the gym, the first exercise is always going to be about three to four sets because you have to warm up and build up to your heaviest weight. The last set being your heaviest weight, you're gonna to go to failure. You're gonna go as, as, as hard as you can with heavy weights, with good form. When you can't ex execute that form anymore, you could either do a drop set or you can have your training partner help you a little bit and, and you're done. Now you go to the next exercise. You're warmed up at this point. Let's say we're doing chest and we're on the incline press. We just did four sets. You know, last set being our heaviest weight, say 405 for, for four reps, okay? With, a, with an extra rep help, for your training party, you did five reps. You're pretty much good now, but we're gonna go on to the next exercise, which is gonna be dumbbell presses. At this point, you could do one or two sets. If, you, if you're really strong, you probably wanna do like a, a semi-heavy set and then the heaviest set. The semi-heavy set would be like six to eight reps, and then the heavy set would be four to eight reps, depending on how much you can get. 
and then go right to the last exercise, which would be like, say, cable crossovers or dumbbell flies. One set, heaviest weight you can do, eight to 12 reps, and you're done. I mean, if you, you know, so you're, you're in essence probably really doing about eight sets total, um, but you're giving 100% to that. You're lifting as heavy weights as you can. You're just not doing it over 14, 15 sets. You're doing it over a small, short period of time. And you, what you'll find is you recover better, you grow better, and when you leave the gym, you don't feel like you, like you, you just uh, run 26 miles. You shouldn't feel like that. If you feel that run down, you're overtraining. And that's, that's really how you execute all, all my exercises like that. Same thing for back. Back, you might, you're gonna have a few more, you're not gonna only do three exercises, you probably do four or five exercises because it's a bigger body part. But once again, after that first initial uh, exercise you're gonna do, uh, where you're gonna do three or four sets, then you're gonna go to one or two sets per, per, per exercise because you don't need to do more because you don't have to warm up again. The muscle's warm already. So you can go right to a heavier set and then your heaviest set. So usually it's two. With shaping exercises, like kind of like a like a, a last you know type of thing, you only need one set. Like I would do um, one arm dumbbell rows as almost the last exercise for back. I'm warmed up already. I go right to my 200 pound dumbbell that I know I can do for six reps, and I do six and try to go for a seventh rep, and I'm done. I don't want to do another set after that. There's no reason to because I'm growing from that heavy set, and because I know I'm only doing one set, I give 100 percent to that. That's the way, that's heavy duty training at its best. That's the way you grow, that's the way you stimulate muscle maximally. If, if you try to do it over 24 sets, there's no way you give enough intensity to any of your exercises and you're gonna look the same week after week after week. Let's get to the questions on the Instagram app. Again, our handle, if you're not already following, official underscore RX Muscle. Let's go to a lot of questions. We'll see how many we can get through. Colo Guerrero or Colo Gero, Steve, after his lengthy time away from the stage, can you see Victor Martinez cracking the top six at the Arnold? You know, I, it's funny because I, I saw some footage recently of Victor training, and I thought his, I haven't seen his legs, but I thought his upper body looked amazing. And I said to myself, man, he, he's really good. I actually texted him. I said, hey, Victor, uh, I want to get you on a heavy muscle, excuse me, heavy muscle. I wanted to get you on uh, live with to do a Road to the Arnold uh, interview. And so we set it up for next week. Because I think he looks good. I want to see what he's doing, what's changed in his life. He obviously is focused on this show. And, you know, Victor always had the tool set to, to, take, to, to win any show that he put his mind to. It seems like he's on a good path. He looks super, the leanest I've seen him at four weeks out. And, uh, and he's big. So uh, we'll have him on next week. We'll find out what's going on with him. Muscle Method. How often would you take a break from high-intensity training to failure and focus on volume with lighter weights slash supersets slash drop sets. You know, I don't, I don't really do that. When I, when I go to supersets or drop sets, I'm still using heavy weights. So let's say, you know, if, let's say I'm dieting for a show and I can normally bench press 405, okay, for reps, for four to six reps. Maybe now, I, because I'm dieting, I can't do 405. I can only do 365 and maybe I can only get three or four reps out. What I would do is I would do a drop set after that, drop it down to maybe 185 and do another four to eight reps, and, and that would be my final set. So I'm intensifying, okay, a slightly lighter weight to get the same intensity level even though I can't lift as heavy because your body doesn't know how much weight you're lifting. It only knows what the intensity you're putting on the muscle is. So that's how I incorporate drop sets or supersets or, or, or even assisted, you know, a little uh, workout partner assisted weight lifting there at the end, forced rep. Because, once again, your own body only knows what it feels. Uh, I never go down to doing like 20, 20 uh, rep sets. I don't think that that does anything. If anything, you're going to lose muscle. Your body only wants to retain as much muscle as it has if you keep, continue to give it that stimulus. Once you take away that stimulus and you're not pushing hard anymore with heavy weights where you're maxly recruiting muscle fibers, your body doesn't need it. You're going to atrophy. And I think that's a big mistake a lot of guys make. And I think that's why a lot of guys lose muscle while they're dieting. Let's go to Tony DeFranco. I started recently hat squatting instead of doing barbell squats because I feel like I can actually focus on my quads and not just moving weight. If I were to solely stick to hacks, you think I'd be missing some leg development? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, hacks are great because you really feel them, right? They really throw a lot of force onto those front quads and it, it isolates it because the, the machine, the sled, is actually stabilizing the weight for you. 
but you're missing all that stabilization action. So when you squat free weight, you're stabilizing everything. What do you think's working to stabilize th th that weight? Uh, your skeletal st structure's not doing that, it's your muscles. So you're involving a lot more muscles in a free weight squat than you would in any kind of machine or sled squat. And I think that's why when you see guys that leg press or just hack squat and they don't, they don't use, you know, do free weight squats, they just don't have the same leg development. Now, if your leg development is already crazy freaky and then you go and start doing hack squats or, or leg press, you probably won't lose that much because you already got the muscle. But to build the muscle to begin with, you got a free weight squat. Let's go to Curry Tony TC. Does Cialis help with lowering blood pressure and protecting your heart while on a cycle like Tess and Trent? You know, Cialis was originally developed as a blood pressure medication and then they realized that it was really Viagra and they realized it had the side effect of causing erections. So they obviously scrapped the blood pressure thing and they realized erection problems are way more profitable. The truth, however, is that Viagra and Cialis, while they do lower blood pressure, they're not like a really great blood pressure medication. Um, you know, the thing that people have to watch out for is though when you take, like some guys take Cialis all the time. If you do that, your blood pressure will be low, you know, even if you're on a big cycle. So make sure you take your blood pressure and, and don't start taking blood pressure medication on top of that if you don't need it. Um, likewise, if you're only taking Cialis on, on a weekend, you know, and your blood pressure you're taking on the weekend, it's nice and low, during the week, if you're not taking it and it goes up, you got to be aware of that as well. So, you know, it's tricky, you know, in there. I know some guys also will get dizzy from Cialis because it drops your blood pressure so much. So it, it, it's strong in a sense, but it's not something you take all the time. So you have to kind of, you know, work it into your regimen. If you do need blood pressure medications because you are running high and you want to protect your kidneys, stay on your ACE inhibitor and just keep an eye of what happens when you mix the ACE inhibitor with the Cialis. If it goes too low, on those days, you might not want to take the, the, the ACE inhibitor. Um, but once again, that's all trial and error, and the only way you can do that is go out and buy a blood pressure cuff you know, from CVS or Walmart, whatever, and test your blood pressure throughout the day. We have two liver-related questions. One from uh, Dada995, does milk thistle really help cleanse your liver? And Josh Natural 01, do you think liver toxicity is overblown in the bodybuilding community? Um, I don't think I don't think anything's overblown. I think you know, if in other words, as bodybuilders who take anabolic steroids, especially orals, we definitely increase liver toxicity issues. The great thing about the liver, which is really we don't see a lot of liver disease in bodybuilders, is that it's regenerative. So if you're not a nutcase and you actually take time off and you clean yourself out and you do the detoxes that I recommend and you take the right milk thistle products. Um, you, your liver can stay relatively you know, cleansed and safe and, and it will, re, will regenerate. The kidneys, on the other hand, don't regenerate. They do regenerate somewhat, but not as well. So they can be, come down. So the kidneys are something you really want to keep more of an eye on. Uh, as far as you know, milk thistle working, there are different qualities of milk thistle, the way there are different qualities of, of, of whey isolate. You know, my whey isolate and isolize is, is 27 and a half grams of protein for 32 gram serving size. There are other whey isolates on the market that are 24 grams per 32 gram serving size. Same name, whey isolate, different product. Same thing with milk thistle. I, you know, did a lot of research on what the best forms were out there. And I happened to like the, the, uh, the product that Bill Llewellyn made uh, called Liver Stable because it contains milk thistle and N-acetylcysteine and some other stuff, which is, I believe, a, a great cocktail to really keep the liver cleansed. Milk thistle opening up those bile ducts, allowing the liver to detoxify itself much more easily, especially when the liver is strained and it tends to swell and those bile ducts get pinched off, the milk thistle keeps them open and allows it to detox much more efficiently. So I said, you know what, I love the product Bill has, I'm gonna sell it on daypalumba.com. I don't need to make it. So if you, if you go to my daypalumba.com and most of my clients and people who ask me for my detox, I send you to my website to buy the milk thistle, I mean the milk thistle product there called Liver Stable because it, it's efficient and it works and it's a high quality of, of, of milk thistle extract, also known as Silimarin. Um, I think that all bodybuilders should take it probably, especially when you're you know, doing a detox or cleanse after your cycle's over to really allow the liver to get rid of all that junk in there. Paulie Leiden, Dave, in your opinion, is it possible to put on size while being in a caloric deficit, but hitting a gram of protein per pound of body weight. 
Say that one more time, Sid. So to possible to gain size while being in a caloric deficit, but getting a pound uh, per body weight. Gram of per pound. Yeah, I mean, when you're in a calorie deficit, okay. it's, hard, it's hard to grow. And I'll tell you why. Because when you're in a calorie deficit and you're burning, you're burning you know, obviously, stored body fat, what's happening is a lot of the protein you're eating and a lot of the fat you're eating will get used as fuel because you're in a calorie deficit. And which sometimes makes it hard to have enough protein to actually build muscle. So yeah, you're taking one gram per pound of body weight, which is just barely the amount you need to grow. And now you're in a calorie deficit, so your body is using some of that protein for fuel. So now you probably don't have enough excess protein to actually build muscle. Because remember, your body's priority is not to build muscle. It's to repair skin, nails, hair, the internal lining of your intestinal tract. These are things that are constantly in a state of turnover. If you don't have enough to provide, if you just have enough protein just to provide that and you don't have enough to repair muscle, your body's not going to prioritize building muscle. It'll just repair what's there. So you're probably going to need to eat more protein at that point if you, if, if you are in a calorie deficit and you want to try to add muscle. Once again, it's stupid to try to do two things at the same time, which is burn fat and build muscle. When you're trying to burn fat, try to maintain your muscle. When you're not trying to burn fat, then you can try to grow because now you can eat extra calories. Paulo Cruz 2015, what happens if you use gear, do any cycle, without testosterone? Um, you know, I, you're going to grow just from taking steroids, period. You know, if you want to get maximal thickness on your body and put on maximal size, testosterone is the way to go. I mean, when I first started, you know, taking anabolic steroids, all I used was anabolics. I didn't use, you know, testosterone because I didn't want to shut my body's natural production down. I used Winstrel and Primabol, and uh, Anabar really wasn't around in the early 90s. They had just, you know, they had just got taken it off the market. But, I mean, the Primabol and, and the Anavar, and I used a little DECA, you know, and I grew for the first year or so. And then after that, I noticed, you know what? I look more ripped. I'm a little bigger. I got veins all over. People at the gym think it's cool, but I have no thickness on my body. And I couldn't add thickness until I added in testosterone. Once I started doing 1,000 milligrams of testosterone a week, it's like everything changed. It was like something, a switch was flipped, and I started adding that necessary thickness and size. You know, of course, I got more side effects. That I got bloated, and I had a gynecomastia. I had to have it removed by Dr. Blau. But... And I got a little more acne, but I put the muscle on that I was looking for. And I think that you have to assess what your goals are. And if your goals are to put on mass and thickness, you're going to need to use testosterone. If you're just looking to look a little better and a little tighter and a little more veiny, then 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 stick with Anavar and and, and Primavol and or Anavar and Winstrel. You know. Let's go to ZT Center. Saw a study that claims supplemental creatine can inhibit myostatin. Is there any truth to this? I mean, it's possible. It's possible. I don't know how much it's going to do of that. You know, um, it seems like it's, a, it's like a one dose thing. You take creatine, you inhibit a little myostatin. Two hours later, the myostatin's back. You know, I always said that the only way that eventually the future is to inhi inhibition of myostatin, but we have to figure out a way that we can inhibit it 24 hours a day, whether it be a pill we take or gene therapy to you know take away the the myostatin gene. However, we do it. When we figure out a way to do it 24 hours a day, we'll see muscle growth from it. Let's go to Jack and Stacked One. Dave, I recently saw your video speaking about Vince Taylor. What are your thoughts on the Vince Taylor grips that he sells on his website? I, uh, I love the Vince Taylor grip. Matter of fact, my kids like the Vince Taylor grip. My son Logan will... He walks, he runs around with it all day long playing with it. And my daughter runs around with it. And I actually have, you know, I, I'm starting to teach my son how to, you know, pull the weights. And he likes to grab the ball and, and pull it and, and do the exercises. But I, I use it. I have a, um, a cable crossover from um, Life Fitness up in my uh, game room in my house. And when the kids are watching TV and at night, I go on there and I do my reverse grip and my, my curls. And I do all my arm exercises with the Vince Taylor grips. I even do my shoulder, you know, forward raises and side laterals holding the, the Vince Taylor grip. I love it. It's so universal. You can you could pretty much do everything on it, really. Um, this, the only ex I even do back on it. I'll do pulls on it. It's just comfortable. What I like to do, however, is I put I wear an exercise glove, you know, where your fingers show. Uh, just because because the, the thing is the uh, the cables a little can can rip into your hand on certain movements that, that it's really not meant for. But if you wear a glove over it, 
you can do anything. It doesn't bother your hand and, and it isolates the muscle so good. I can't tell you, I feel like every move, it's like my mind is so connected to that muscle because of the grip is so natural. It's really an ingenious little device and like I said, if you, you can put it in your pocket and bring it to the gym with you and, and use it at your local gym if you want. I have, once again, I have a cable machine in my house so I just use it up there but it's very, very convenient. Uh, it's, it, it, for some reason, it, it's cool looking too. I don't know. He, he, he did a great job on it. I got to commend Vince for that. And I think it's, uh, it's going to be uh, something that every gym will have at some point when they realize how good the, the device is. And, it, and it's not expensive, so there's no reason why every gym shouldn't have it. Let's go to Ben Joseph. Dave, I'm a huge milk drinker, probably three gallons a week, 1%. How much do the lactose impact, impact my blood sugar levels, and will it negatively affect my physique as I diet down? If you could digest lactose, in other words, if you're not lactose intolerant and you have the ability to, to break down lactose and digest it, milk is fine. The problem is that most adults cannot. They think they can, they really can't, because you have a limited amount of lactase enzyme, even if you do produce any. What I've also found is as you get older, you lose the ability to digest lactose. So you might be able to digest it when you're in your early 20s. By the time you hit 30, you probably can't digest it anymore. So. I like to stay away from anything that has lactose in it. You know, dairy or fermented milk products a little easier to digest because the, the bacteria kind of break down the lactose for you. But when we're talking about like milk products, straight milk products, probably not, a, not the best idea to get your protein from a lot of milk. Once again, who am I to say there are people out there who can digest it, just not a lot. Let's go to Devin McHazlitt. Is a keto diet more beneficial for bulking for a diabetic or is moderate carbs better for bulking for a diabetic? For diabetics, okay, type one we're talking about who don't produce any insulin, obviously a ketogenic diet is great because your insulin requirements are really low. So it's very easy to keep your blood sugars in check. And a lot of people like that because of the simplicity of it. Because once you start adding carbs to your daily meals, now you have to up your insulin and you have to try to you know, figure out how much you need. And usually you need more of a long acting and you need more short acting. So most diabetics like to eat, if they don't eat a ketogenic diet, they eat low carbs, okay? Uh, especially in the off season. Now pre-contest, if you're doing a show, as a diabetic, most, guy, most diabetics do very well on ketogenic diets. Once again, because the insulin requirements are low and the less insulin you take, the easier you burn fat. Um, what I found is a lot of type one diabetics if they eat a ketogenic diet, they get in shape really quickly, okay? You know, the more carbs you eat, the more you have to try to adjust for that and take more insulin. Now, if I'm a diabetic that's smart, I'm gonna take extra insulin rather than too little insulin because I want, I'd rather have my blood sugars run a little low than too high because then you get side effects, right? So when you're taking a little more insulin, you tend to grow better, but you also tend to store fat a little easier. So. I wouldn't want to have to worry about that in, in the uh, pre-contest period. And I certainly don't want to skimp on my insulin pre-contest so that I lose weight more easily, but I, yet I, have, I accumulate more side effects. So pre-contest, ketogenic diet, great for type ones. Off-season, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go full ketogenic diet, but I would eat a lower carb intake. So I'm going to admit something. Usually I put up the questions or post on Instagram at about, say, noon for that day's episode. And you know, we usually get about 55 to 60 questions. Today, we blew past that. I posted it earlier in the day. So we have a lot of questions we're not going to be able to get to today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send these messages individually to Dave, and I'm going to have Dave record three, three, four-minute responses. We'll clip them, and we'll post that to our YouTube channel. We'll try to knock out a couple of more while we're still at it. Uh, Alexander Jerozmanov butchered that name for sure. I would like to know your opinion on gear that have passed their expiration date, can they go wrong or are they safe for use? I, I get quite asked this question all the time. And, you know, while officially, you know, I have to say when it hits an expiration date, it, it, you shouldn't use it. The truth of the matter is, especially oil-based anabolics, they probably last for five to 10 years after that at full potency. I just don't think they lose their potency. I've used stuff that was way past expiration dates still worked really well. Matter of fact, I had uh, some G growth hormone in a friend's refrigerator. I had given them to hold. For, I don't remember why. Um, <laughs> probably I was paranoid or something like that. And I forgot he had it. 
10 years later, he's cleaning out this refrigerator in his garage, and he said, Dave, you know, I, I just found, I found you, I think I had given him like a couple kits of GH, and it was probably five years past the expiration date. And I said, well, whatever, and I used it, and you know what? I got great results on it. So I don't think this stuff goes bad if you keep it in a, in a, in a controlled environment. Obviously, if you're subjecting it to severe heat, okay, or dampness, that could, you know, especially for orals, that could break it down a little faster. But by and far, oil-based injectables seem to last a long time. The Real Marco Polo, different types of cardio for contest prep, or do you prefer low intensity around 120 BPM? Yeah, I mean, everyone's low intensity is different. You know, usually around anywhere from 125, 135 beats a minute. The problem is when I tell people that, there's some people that take a massive amount of stimulants every day and energy drinks, and they're, when they start their cardio, they're at 120 beats a minute already. So that, you know, what I tell people is if you're walking on a treadmill 3.2 to 3.6 miles per hour in that range someplace, uh, no incline, it's usually a good pace to move at where you're not running, but you're moving fast, but you're, you're still able to have a conversation with the person next to you, and you're not overexerting, and you're pretty much predominantly burning stored body fat. Uh, once you start doing high intensity cardio, once again, you switch your metabols and now you're burning carbs as a fuel source in the absence of enough uh, glycogen in the muscles, okay, and glucose in the bloodstream, you're going you're gonna to metabolize, you know, muscle tissue. So that's not what we're looking for. When we do cardio, we're looking to burn stored body fat. So you got to keep the intensity level lower, okay, than you would say if you're on a step, step master and you're going crazy running like a lunatic. That's not going to burn stored body fat the way you want it to. Time for a couple of more questions. One from Fedor Fitness. Dave, do you know if Titan Medical uh, can help with a fertility prescription? Um, I know they have HCG and I know they do Clomid. Uh, I'm working with them to try to get HMG available as well because a lot, obviously, you know, that's part of my pregnancy protocol and a lot of people, you know, want to purchase that. It, it's not the easiest thing. They got to try to find someone who domestically, you know, in the United States compounds HMG, which for some reason seems to be tough because it's not a drug that's used a lot. But um, I think eventually they will, but you could at least get started on the HCG and the Clomid. And for a lot of people, that, that's enough, you know, uh, and they get great results from that. Let's go to Jared Smith. Dave, over the last few weeks, this show has done a lot more training-related questions, which is awesome. I want to know, in general, what is the Dave Palumbo training philosophy? I think I pretty much laid that out right in the beginning of the show. You know, uh, you know, less volume, higher intensity, less sets, you know, enough days off to recover, You're not overworking the muscle on weak body parts, don't train it more, train it less. Uh, Though, though that's pretty much the tenets, you know, push to failure, but when the muscle stops working, stop the set, don't cheat. Because when you cheat with other body parts, you're training the muscle incorrectly, and you're training it to, to depend on other muscles that it shouldn't be. If you're doing bench presses and, and your pecs are, are fatigued and they can't lift the weight anymore, and, and then you start rolling your shoulders forward, you're not training pecs anymore. So you gotta be sm you gotta train smart, and when you train with less sets and less volume, you can focus more on the sets that you are doing and give maximum intensity and effort. That is going to do for this episode of Ask Dave. Again, brought to you by Species Nutrition and Liquid Sunrise. We have a jam-packed slate of interviews this week. We're going to be posting a graphic on our Instagram page with the full schedule. And then next week, hopefully, we're going to be starting up our Road to the Arnold Classic. We have Chris Dim. One of the most inspirational stories in all of bodybuilding, we have him. Uh, we're going to post exactly when we're going to have him, but we have that interview in the can. So that and a lot more Arnold competitors over the next few weeks. For our producer, Tyler Shore and Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Baruki. We'll see you next time.